So it's my pleasure to be here and tell you um, some of our recent work on um, using deep neural networks in combination with a large amount of ataxic data across the immune system in order to understand um, processes related to differentiation as they're encoded in the genome itself. And here I wanted to underscore the word understanding um, because what I'm really excited about these days is this opportunity to open up black box complex model like neural networks in order to actually understand some of the biology that they've learned in making accurate inferences for complex problems. So let me start off with um, kind of an acknowledgement slide. So this was a really um, fun group of people uh, that allowed us um, to kind of get this project going. So it's a very close, uh, close collaboration with Christoph Benoit, who has an immunology lab at Harvard Medical School, and three students that uh, really led the project, Sasha and Mark from my group, and Ricardo, a postdoc in Christoph's um, group. And, then, and throughout this project, we had a lot of um, nice and fruitful interactions with a bunch of cool immunologists through the MGen um, project that you'll hear a little bit about later. So um, motivation of this goes back to this fundamental question in biology, which you all are very familiar with, uh, which is how is it that every cell type in our body essentially has the same static copy of the genome, yet we have many different cell types with different functions. Um, so a really good example, a well-studied example of this is in the immune system where um, immunologists for the past um, two decades have identified and characterized at least 100 different immune cell types, um, yet we know they're all differentiated from the same uh, progenitor cell. So here's an exa a small example of this um, immune subtype, cell types that we know, all with the same genome. So how does this dichotomy arise? Of course, a major part of this, a major answer to this, um, part of the answer to the question is very well known to you all regulatory um, genomics audience, uh, which is based on differential usage of regulatory regions across um, um, the genome. So here's a cartoon example of this. We have three different cell types, each having their own distinct regulatory regions that then allow for um, control of downstream gene expression that has specificity. So um, in more details, um, the major assumption being that these differential regulatory regions have differences in sequence composition that then allow for encoding of um, sets of um, motifs that, that could be distinct to each cell type, and these differential regulatory motifs allow for um, downstream regulation of gene expression. Now, um, even though we know how this process works at high level, um, we don't know enough details to answer simple what and why question um, in terms of individual regulatory regions. So the what question would be given a region, even if we know it's regulatory, we would like to know which cell type is it important for. And the why question would be to go a little bit deeper and say, if we know a region is regulatory in particular cell types, why so? So what, um, um, and from what sequence information is contained in that region that allows it to behave the way it does. So if we can answer this why question, that means we can kind of look at arbitrary sequences and understand their meaning. Um, so um, thanks to recent development and technologies, we are very close to answering the what question, at least by annotating um, regions and their cell type profiles with a number of different epigenomic assays. Um, I have some of their um, names in the bottom, uh, but the summary is as the technologies have matured, including ChIP-seq, HiSeq, ATAC-seq, they're now being applied in consortium settings where we can systematically um, interrogate many different cell types, many different tissue types, and annotate regulatory regions with um, kind of their cell type activity profiles. But um, what I want to talk about in this talk is how do we go from these um, annotations to answering the deeper why question. So can we just look at sequence features and context and try to understand um, what determines um, the regulatory activity of a particular region? 
So one of the main ingredients for doing this is going to be ATAC seq data as generated across a large number of cell types. So let me just briefly go over um, some of the basics. So in an ATAC seq experiment, what we can do is isolate a population of cells of interest. Now we can even do it for single cells, but in this context, we're going to talk about purified cell types. So for instance, a bunch of NK cells, and then we can identify genome-wide all regions that are um, potentially regulatory active in that um, cell population. The idea being that these regulatory active regions are likely to be depleted for nucleosomes, so the assay is designed to identify and pull down these open chromatin regions. So um, not that creatively, these regions that we're identifying, we call them open chromatin regions, or OCR for short, sometimes are um, referred to as candidate regulatory elements. The other thing I wanted to point out is that when we're talking about a population of cells, we have these quantitative signal, um, which is basically the number of reads, and this can serve somewhat as a proxy for um, the strength of regulatory strength of that region in that population of cells. So now, as of a few years ago, um, the technology was maturing that we could apply it to maybe a handful of cell types and start comparing their regulatory regions. Um, what's been really cool today is that now the technology is mature to be applied in a very large um, scale to a really large number of cell types. So a nice example of this um, large scale experimentation was done by the Imgen Consortium, which I had an opportunity to contribute to. So what Imgen Consortium did is, um, essentially this is um, so a group of 20 immunologists, brave immunologists, um, what they did was isolated 90 different immune cell types from adult mice. So these 90 different cell types essentially cover all known um, immune cell types that are characterized and can be isolated. And then systematically in a very centralized way, I um, generated a toxic profile for all of these 90 immune cell types. So this um, kind of differentiation tree that you're seeing here tells us the relationship between all these different cell types that were um, profiled. Um, so the names you can't see, they're pretty cryptic and maybe only immunologists can interpret them, uh, but maybe what you're more familiar with is from these higher level lineage designation. But the point that I want to make is that within each lineage, uh, for instance, B cells, there's a number of subtypes that are functionally distinct, um, but they are more similar to each other than um, cell types of other lineages. So um, in this kind of first analysis of the paper that was published um, last year, we spent a lot of time on um, answering the what question, so characterizing these data and annotating the genome. Um, and at the end of the day, what this allowed us to do is come up with 500 OCRs, 500 regions that are typically 200 base pair long, and associate with each an activity profile across all these different immune um, cell types. Now, what I want to talk about is how do we use uh, the same data to go uh, one step further and try to answer the why question. So by looking at the sequence composition of a region, how much can we infer about its cell type um, activity and differentiation? So um, kind of the first uh, approach one can use to try to answer this why question is through classical motif analysis. And um, actually, Wyeth, that was the first keynote, gave a really nice historical overview of where we've come in this field um, and how uh, long ago uh, many of the methods that are used today were invented. Uh, classical, so classical motif analysis, what we would do is um, essentially identify a set of OCRs of interest, for instance, the ones that are um, specifically active in a population of cell types, um, do a motif enrichment compared to some background, and then try to characterize them by mashing them up, uh, these motifs, to known regulatory um, factor binding um, uh, motifs through online databases. So as, uh, and um, actually the first publication that came out of this, we spent a lot of time um, doing motif analysis, but what you can appreciate is that um, once we start talking about find differences between related cell type, this becomes a lot more challenging to do with any sort of stratified analysis. Um, so kind of to exemplify this, what I'm showing you here is um, each dot in this plot is basically one regulatory region, one OCR, and you can see the signal strength in t rex cells and T-conventional cells. So these are two cells that are very close to each other in this lineage tree. And what you can notice is that once we start talking about closely related cell types, 
they're going to be sharing majority of the open regulatory regions that we identify, and typically a handful, maybe in the hundreds, that are um, different, have differential activity between them. So any kind of stratified analysis is not really going to have power to go too deep um, with this data. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is actually the size of the nodes here, which, so each is cell type. So the size um, kind of um, as relative to the number of unique OCRs we see for that cell type in compared to a sister cells. Um, so it's like, as you can see, uh, maybe a relative size of these cells, the ones that are near to each other are going to share a majority of their regulatory regions. So a different way of looking at this problem is through the lens of um, supervised machine learning. Um, and this is, again, a classical formulation. Um, so what we can say is that um, we want to train a machine learning model that takes as input these OCR sequences that are typically 200 base pair long in this context and can predict on the basis of sequence alone the activity profile across all the different cell types that we've measured. So this is, for each cell type, we have just um, average activity profile. So this kind of is the average peak height that I was showing in the previous slides. Now, if you frame the problem in a multitask learning framework like I have here, so we have, we're predicting multiple outputs at the same time, then all of a sudden we can use all the data that we've generated to solve this problem. So we have a lot more data to play with rather than stratified analysis. So the question is what kind of models can we use here? Um, this has a deep, uh, long history in regulatory genomics and there's many different approaches one can use. Um, so in our context, we're going to use neural network. Um, they've done really well for this kind of task, task in regulatory genomics, and you'll see some of that later um, as well. So one uh, note that I wanted to make um, before moving um, to details is um, actually our ultimate goal, we would like our models to be accurate, but our ultimate goal is not prediction because we're actually assuming pretty much com uh, complete information. So we assume we're, we have quantified um, right regions and all the cell types, but uh, the goal is to um, dissect a model that's learned this relationship between sequence um, to activity profiles to um, learn um, some of the, mot uh, some of the um, biology uh, into motifs and their regulations. So, um, so why neural network? Um, our work was really inspired by the ones that came before us, and in particular, um, David Kelly's work on Bassett that showed convolutional neural network uh, when trained on um, large compendia of, of ENCODE data set um, that consisted of ChIP-seq and, and, um, and DNA-seq data outperformed other models. So the question that we wanted to ask to build on this was, um, so it's nice that we can use these models to differentiate between cell lines and uh, maybe tissue types, but what about more subtle differences between primary cells where we know um, there's a handful or maybe hundreds of regions that are distinguishing them? Do we have, um, how far can we get at the cell type resolution? And the second question was, um, how much can we trust the primaries of neural networks to learn motifs and or combinations? So um, just a very um, brief um, review of convolutional neural network. I'm sure you all are experts now because neural networks can do magic on every problem these days. They weren't like that when I was um, kind of training neural networks 20 years ago, but the story has really changed. So neural networks, um, so the convolutional neural networks are um, been really state of the art for image understanding in the last um, couple of years. Um, and they uh, end up working very well for sequences because finding objects in sequences has a lot of shared characteristics as finding kind of motifs in longer sequences. Um, and the, the, the way um, uh, we know that they work and they work well is that they um, automatically learn um, this hierarchical representation of features and their combination. So for instance, in the case of images, um, the first layer neurons have shown consistently to be showing lower level features, for instance, edges, then um, the later neurons are learning higher level concepts like ears, nose, and tails in the case of dogs. And then these are put together in the last layer to construct an embedding of the images that then allows for prediction of the output. So what about uh, in the case of sequences? In the case of sequences, we have a similar logic going on. So um, when we're inputting sequences, these first um, layer neurons learn shorter uh, motifs that are represented by uh, position weight matrices or PWNs. Um, these shorter motifs are get scanned across 
these input images uh, sequences and um, their combinations are learned in the later layer that then allow for an embedding um, of sequences in this embedding space that um, allows the model to make the final predictions. Now, um, so uh, in our context, what we're doing is basically training a convolutional neural network that takes input sequences, again, these are 200 base pair long, and simultaneously predicts activity profile across all these different cell types. And again, I'll mention that, um, so the number of training sequences that we have is about half a million. So um, let me first summarize our contributions um, and then um, dig into the details um, together later. So on the computational side, um, one observation we've made is that the form of loss function is very important when we want to get at cell specificity as opposed to kind of identifying ubiquitous features of sequences that make them regulatory active in all cell types. Um, and the second is that to um, really um, interpret models, we need to consider uncertainty across different model runs of the model. So an ensemble model to interpretation turns out to be a lot more robust and meaningful. Um, on the biological so, uh, side, as I'll show you, um, I think the models and the data combined with the data that uh, we can generate today have the power to make prediction at the cell type uh, resolution, which is really cool. And um, by carefully interpreting the parameters, um, we can really recover a lot of known biology, which gives confidence to um, kind of new motifs and new combinations that can come out of these models. So um, kind of first question is, um, what kind of model architecture are we using? We actually spend a couple of months trying to optimize uh, model architecture in terms of how many hidden layers do we need, how many convolutional layers do we need, and things like this. And at the end, we came up with this conclusion that um, an architecture very similar to that was used in Bassett, and also DeepC uses a very similar architecture, works really well. Um, so the conclusion I had is that for this task of going from regulatory sequence to some sort of activity across tissues or cell types, there's a sweet spot of architecture that um, tend to work well across different um, data modalities. Um, so, um, so while the architecture um, seemed to, uh, this kind of the same architecture seemed to work well, what I think was a little bit more important was the form of loss function that we used. So how do we measure uh, models performance, which is the key to kind of adjusting its parameter and key to what it eventually learns. Um, for this, we ended up using um, essentially one minus Pearson correlation of the output. So this is kind of a pictorial representation of what I mean by this. So imagine that this is the ground truth signal. We have some activity in MK and CD8 and lower activity in B cells and CD4 for a given input sequence. Um, so if a model predicts something like this, we're gonna just take the correlation between these two uh, vector representation of these bars. So that's simply just a correlation between these two sets of bars. Um, in this case, um, the second row will have high correlation with the ground truth and the bottom row will have low correlation. So that's um, all that is to it. But I think the reason why it works well is that it really forces the model to think about um, optimizing prediction for sequences where we have some variability across cell types, as opposed to focusing on um, um, regulatory regions that might be might have um, ubiquitous activity. And one thing that we've noticed, and I think you can see this in um, all kind of epigenomic data sets, is that regions that are ubiquitously active generally have higher um, signal strength. Um, so if we use a standard loss like mean squared error, the model will spend a lot of um, its energy trying to optimize the error on regions that are ubiquitously active, basically. So um, how does a model actually perform? So um, we can measure this on standard cross-validation where um, we leave out 10% of our um, OCRs as tests, we use the remaining for training. Um, and then remember that for each OCR, we're making a, a 90 dimensional prediction. So that's activity in each of the cell types. So we can correlate that with ground truth. And if we do that, um, we get a histogram of correlation values. So this is um, on the real data. We can do the same thing when we shuffle the labels. Um, so you can see that um, the predictions on the real data are significantly shifted from the null um, predictions. 
Um, and in fact, about 60% of sequences have a statistically significant um, prediction. So this was really nice. And um, we can now hone in on some of the um, OCRs for which we can actually predict um, well. What do they typically look like? So this is an example of the ground truth labels or uh, ground truth activity profile associated with one OCR. Um, you can see that um, this particular OCR is pretty active in T cells, but within T cell, it has, um, um, uh, has fine scale differences depending on the subtype of the T cell. And you can see that the model here recapitulates this fine grain differences, which I thought were really cool because these are small differences between um, subtypes within the same lineage. Now, um, we can say more broadly, if you look at um, OCRs that are um, predicted well by our model, so that uses correlation loss, what, do, what does the activity profile, so the attack um, signal generally looks like? So on the rows here, we have a bunch of well-predicted OCRs. On the column, we have their um, cell type activity profile and ground truth. Um, so this is, what you can see is that the well-predicted OCRs tend to have variable activity across cell types. Um, but what we observe is that with um, like a standard MSC loss, the well-predicted OCRs tend to be the ones that are more ubiquitous. I can qu uh, quantify this globally, I won't go through it, but can quantify it globally um, based on all predicted OCRs and how variable they are um, um, and which ones are well predicted with a correlation loss and mean square loss. So this was all nice, um, but as we all know, cross-validation is not the ultimate way to assess model general generalizability. And what we need to do is to go to an external data set which has hopefully slightly different um, characteristics that allow us to really test the model in the wild. So how well did it actually learn the relationship between sequence and activity profile in this case? So for this, um, we were actually very um, lucky that there was this other um, um, large scale attack seek experiment done in humans. Um, so this was published a few years ago. Um, what they done was generate a attack seek profile with a very similar protocol as the ones we had in Imgen across 23 different immune um, cell types. This was done in humans. Remember that our data is coming from mouse. Um, and then 18 of these 23 cell types were matched between um, human and mouse data sets. So we could test prediction on 18 different cell types. Um, and so for this data, um, there was uh, 400,000 um, OCRs that were available with similar type of length. So what we did was um, just take our model out of the box and apply it to this um, human data set. And what we saw here is, again, a similar histogram that I showed you before. Um, so the predictions, the correlation predictions on the real data and on shuffled data. And what you can again see is that um, the predictions are shifted. So for real data on human, the model that was trained on mouse can actually do fairly well for a good portion of these um, OCRs. And what I want to point out is that this is actually, this was to me was very exciting because this is actually a pretty hard problem if you just think about it in terms of alignment of regulatory regions. So if you were to take these um, 400,000 regulatory regions in human with standard alignment tools like liftover, only about 15% of them would align to a mouse regulatory region. So at the alignment level, it's really hard. Um, and to, in order to make predictions that are accurate, what the model has to do is to actually figure out what motifs are important and embedded within those larger sequences um, to be able to um, tell um, uh, activity profile from the sequence. So um, now here, um, I was pretty convinced that we've learned something cool about the relationship between sequence features and activity profiles, but let's see to what extent can we dissect um, the parameters of the model um, to learn uh, motifs under combinations are important for making these predictions. Um, so this is a really um, active area of research trying to interpret parameters of neural network. Uh, we've tried a bunch. I won't um, go into the details and kind of comparisons that we've done, but uh, let's just start from the simplest approach we can use. And the simplest approach is basically a node-based strategy. So we can look at each of these nodes in the first layer going to call them filters when they're a convolutional layer. So each filter, we can associate it with a position weight matrix that has learned. 
um, based on identifying subsequences that are activated by this node and then constructing a PWM from them. And then for each filter, we can also um, um, associate it with an important score. So, and that's through like an ablation experiment when if you remove this filter, how much does it hurt our performance um, across um, cell types? Um, so summary is that um, we can extract PWM associated with each of these nodes and then assign an important score to that PWM. So here's um, the figure that was pretty cool to me. So um, what I'm showing you here is each dot here is one PWM, correspond to one um, the PWM learned by each filter. Um, on the x-axis, we have the information content of the PWM, so how peaked is it? And on the y-axis, we have this influence score. Um, according to the model, how important is it for model's prediction? And then what we can do is we can take each of these PWMs and go match them up to known transcription factor binding databases, for instance, SysBP or JASPAR. So then we can say which one of these PWMs actually correspond to some known um, motif and which ones have no match in online databases. And the reason why this um, figure was so cool to me is because as you can see, majority of these PWMs that are learned have some counterpart, have no, uh, correspond to some known motifs. And if I were a very obnoxious computational person speaking, um, I would say that basically in one really nice data set and one fitting model, we're recovering maybe 20 years of motif discovery. Um, that's not exactly the way I want to frame it, but um, I guess the, the reason why I was excited is that we are recovering many of or most of the known um, major immune regulators um, that we think should be involved in this differentiation process. So this gives us confidence to go and um, dissect um, the fewer number of uh, motifs that didn't have any match to known databases. And we're in the process of doing this. Um, but another question that you can also ask is, so how stable are these PWMs that we're learning? Um, so the models um, are not convex. Obviously, they depend on initialization. We can get to the same output with different settings of the parameters. Um, so how robust are these? Um, and the way to answer this um, question, what we did was essentially train um, 11 different models on the same data with um, kind of a random subset of the data. Uh, and then for each model, come up with um, a node for each, uh, sorry, a PWM for each filter in the first layer, and then ask how many times do we see that filter in the other models? And we do this by just a motif matching algorithm. So what we can, uh, you can see in this plot is um, these kind of 300, um, 300 uh, filters that I showed in the previous plot um, and PWMs associated with them. Um, and then again, information content and the influence to the model here, the influence on the, is on the log scale. Um, and then for each one, we can say how many, how many other runs of the model did we see this PWM in? And um, the summary is that for PWMs that have high information content and are more influential, uh, we see them a lot. But then for PWMs that are not that influential, um, they're actually not that reproducible. And something that I won't show any results on, happy to discuss later, is that um, we've realized that um, if you go uh, use now other model interpretation approaches, um, it's, um, what we find is that these motifs that are reproduced across runs are the ones that um, kind of reproduce across different model um, interpretation techniques. So um, kind of taking an ensemble approach and assessing this uncertainty is more important, um, I think, than kind of the, interpret the exact interpretation model that you're using for the purpose of identifying PWMs. Um, so now what we can do is uh, for each of these PWMs, for each of these motifs, we can try to associate them with a known transcription factor based on matching to um, databases like SysPP. And then we can look at um, the model's uh, predicted influence of each of these PWMs across our cell types. And if we do this, um, it's uh, really cool that then we can try to associate this, um, the, the influence of each PWM um, to, we can associate it with the expression of that corresponding transcription factors. And in some cases, this also allows us to refine the assignment of you know, transcription factors to um, motifs. So here's an example for PAX5, where we can see the predicted influence of PAX5 PWM across B cells 
um, is very consistent with um, the expression profile of um, PAX5 and the same cell types. So um, one deeper question that you can ask is that, so it's, it's nice that these first layer filters correspond to known PWMs and we can look at kind of their influences per cell type, but what about higher um, order combinations of motifs in the deeper layers? So one way to approach this is to first look at this embedding that the model has learned. So we can um, basically um, run each, all of our training sequences um, through the model to get activation of this last layer, um, uh, last ray of our network, which is about a thousand neurons. And we can then use TSNI for instance to project um, this to a two dimensional space. If you, if you do this, so each dot in the space is now a sequence, and then we can color them by um, kind of maximum activity in a given lineage. What you can see is that it's pretty coherent um, in terms of um, projecting sequences in the space that tells us something about relationship between cell types and lineages. Um, but to some extent, we actually expect to see a coherent picture like this because this is the training data. The real test is that if we were to apply the same logic to sequences that the model hasn't seen before, how coherent does it actually look? So for this, we can, act, we can go back to the human and mouse data set. So um, we can project the human sequences to the same space. And um, it's nice to see that they're actually projected together with the mouse sequences. It's not true that you see a separate human cluster um, as we would see if the model was um, kind of overfitting. And what you can see, if we actually um, display the um, lineage um, activity of these sequences and the human sequences, um, then we also see this, again, this coherent picture. So maybe you can't read this, um, what the colors mean, but uh, for instance, this yellow is all the myeloid cell, this, um, the blue here is all the B cells um, and so on. So um, kind of the last note that I'll leave you on is um, trying to extract combinations from um, these um, neural network, which is, so what combinations of these first layer motifs that we've learned are actually important for models prediction. And what I'll leave you there is that what we found is it's actually much more complicated to try to find um, robust combinations um, because usually combinations that are important for immune differentiation happen only in a few sequences. So extracting that in a robust way is an ongoing um, area of work for us. Uh, but what I can tell you is that um, kind of this more global picture of how complex is the regulatory code. And the way we can answer this question is to say for any given um, sequence, any given OCR, how many um, how many motifs are needed by the model to make its ultimate prediction. And so this is a histogram of that, and we can do this by this ablation strategy and analyzing the data on a per OCR basis. So if you do this, um, we can see that something between three and four filters or three and four motifs are required for making predictions for each OCR. And there's also a large number of OCRs um, where a lot more PWMs are needed. So um, last summary slide, I'll end it with, um, so um, I think it's really neat that we can uh, combine large scale experimentation with epigenomic assays with neural network and actually try to dissect models to learn regulatory mechanisms from them. Um, it's, um, it, I would say it's pretty robust, at least in our hands to derive motifs, but then uh, figuring out that combinations need a little bit more work. Um, I already gave the acknowledgments, but I also want to make sure that I uh, mention that, um, so our paper describing all of this is on BioArchive. Um, code and sample data is available from GitHub. And actually, as Sean mentioned um, in the beginning, it's true that uh, my lab is moving from UBC to University of Washington. These are two beautiful cities. Um, you can judge which one looks um, nicer, but my coordinates will change um, as of a few months. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation again, and thank you so much for um, attention. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was wonderful. So we have lots of questions. So um, first one here is from Lucia uh, Peixoto. Are regulatory regions that are not unique to a cell type, but significantly more open in one lineage versus another uh, being considered? Yeah, so we use all of the, so all of the data and, um, and so the model essentially will learn any patterns, but what we realize that with the form of the loss, you can 
um, manipulate the model so that it pays more emphasis to variable OCRs versus the ones that are more ubiquitous. I, that, uh, that was uh, actually one that I was going to ask you as a follow-up then. Do you have to account for the, the open regions that are shared across many cell types then because they just contain sort of noise yeah. from the purpose of... Yeah, of right. Um, so we don't do anything unique. So we've tried actually a lot of manipulations and I think like besides this change in correlation loss, nothing else made that huge of a difference. So one thing that, one obvious thing that you can try is weighting the examples or weighting the OCR so we can put a higher weight on the ones that are variable and a lower weight on the ones that are not. That pretty much gets us the same um, uh, performance as we would with the loss function that we had. Great. Um, but, so yeah, that's a really interesting question because maybe that says um, maybe we can train two models simultaneously, one for predicting these kind of like ubiquitous OCRs and there could be interesting signal there and one on variable OCRs. Right. If it was separated out as a class, perhaps it might be. Yeah. Um, this is from Irene Kaplow. Um, uh, the cross-species result is really nice. Do the, does the model do better for cross-species prediction on some cell types than it does on others? If so, are there known differences between species for the cell types where it does poorly? Okay, yeah, that's a really great question. We haven't really dissected that. That's, we're actually working on that right now to figure out um, what sequences can we predict well and whatnot. I mean, the, the obvious thing that I can tell you is that there was actually, in the human data, there was one cell type that was measured, not measured in mouse, and we did horribly on that cell type, as might be expected. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a subject of ongoing investigation. Uh, here's another one from uh, Walter Mullman. A nice talk. Have you seen any positional effects of OCR sequences? For example, whether the centers or flanks contain more information? Yeah, that's another really nice um, question. We haven't looked at that systematically for a while. We try to figure out if there are um, distances or fixed distances between motifs that are important for models prediction. Um, and kind of this goes back to, I think, something that Anshul gave a talk on in um, previous um, our MLCSB COSI, um, it was really hard to robustly identify fixed differences between uh, motifs, like beyond um, periodicity that um, Anshul talked about. But, um, and I think because uh, maybe it's, um, it varies from motif to motif and from region to region. So yeah, we don't have a systematic answer for that yet. Uh, we have time for another one or two, I think. Uh, Jan Grau has a couple in the questions here, but uh, I'll ask one here. For the, for the number of PWM per OCR, do you have an impression about how similar or redundant these three or four PWMs are? Okay, that's a very great, great question, and I'm glad you brought it up. So um, one thing that we do observe is that, um, so for some of the PWMs that are very important, for instance, um, uh, SPI1 in this context, we have a couple of varied representations. So you can say maybe the, um, the, it's a, there's a redundant representation of that PWM because it's captured by three or four different nodes. Um, so of course we need to um, uh, account for this when we're counting the influence of motifs per cell type. And we've done some of this by trying to group um, motifs or try to group filters and count the influence of a group once. So I would say to some extent what you saw tries to account for that, but probably not perfectly. Okay, we'll take one more from uh, Judith Zaug. Uh, do you think this approach can also be used to identify motifs from single cell RNA-seq data, for example, taking promoter sequences? Do you have a feeling for how much better attack would perform versus RNA? Okay, great question. I would say I don't have a um, feeling about attack versus RNA. Well, actually, I do have a feeling I think attack works better right now for the purpose of just like kind of thinking about a small regulatory regions and its activity profile. Because if you want to go to RNA-seq, you would have to have a larger window. And um, I mean, that's uh, a lot of people are working on that. Uh, but so I think for the purpose of like identifying motifs, maybe like smaller windows offered by attack might be, give you more precise answers. And in the, in the uh, so in question about um, single cell, that's actually what we're working on right now. And it's super cool. So you can imagine models where you have one node per cell. So if you have like a 10,000 single cell data set, then you have 10,000 nodes as output and maybe we can learn cool things uh, by that um, subject to ongoing investigation. That's awesome. Thank you.